Hey everyone, we're shooting another Ask a GN episode. This one, not from the normal studio. We are still in California as of this shooting, but I don't know if this will go out after we get home. It probably will. So we're in Southern California now. Today we visited MSI, CyberPower, NZXT. We'll be visiting EVGA and iWebPower shortly. A couple of companies are visiting Cloud Imperium Games, of course. But we're not talking about that today. Today we're doing Ask GN. So as always, comment in the comment area below if you have questions uh leave your questions down there i'll try and address them next time we tried to shoot this in a nicer area than the corner of the hotel room but the spineless rent-a-cop security guard didn't allow it so we're here uh, first question is from terence mccann who says hey steve when a graphics card is outputting 1600 by 900 signal to a 1920 by 1080 monitor what handles the stretching of the pixels so that it fits the whole scale of the display, the monitor, is it the monitor or the GPU? Also, what is the process called? That is called the scaling, as I believe you even said in your, you, you answered your own question in, in the question. So it's called scaling and the process itself, there are two components that handle it. One is in the monitor, one's in the GPU, and which one gets used kind of depends on the application or what you've configured in Windows, things like that. Uh, so the, the component specifically is called a scaler. There are scalers in most monitors, not all, and there are scalers in GPUs. If you have uh, a laptop, for example, notebooks often don't have a scaler in the display. Korean monitors, a lot of the Korean 1440p monitors that are cheaper can uh, be cheaper by eliminating things like the scaler. And so in those instances, the laptop, the Korean monitors that are cheaper, when they don't have scalers, they will rely on the GPU to handle the scaling of the, the resolution. So that's what that is, and that's how that works. Now on Windows, one note here, you can actually go through Control Panel and force it to always use the GPU if for some reason you preferred that, uh, but it's not really, not really that important, just kind of a side note in case you needed to for some reason. But basically the scaler, whether there is one or not in the display, is just a cost thing, and uh, the GPUs will have one if your monitor does not. So that's all, that's all there is to that answer, very easy. Next question is from Reps Up, who's uh, Reps Up 100, I think, who says, as a actually kind of big question, is it true that GPU reviewers use already existing results for newer benchmarks? I came across this from another site. I was curious to know if there's any truth to it, and then goes on to quote whatever the other site is that says, uh, I'll read part of this, I guess. They say, what you have to realize is that most big YouTube channels keep previous results, say they benchmarked RX 480 and The Witcher 3 on day one of RX 480 release. Three months down the line, they're testing a GTX 1060, and they get that number and plug it into their already existing results. I can't speak for other sites or other channels. I can speak for ours only, and uh, the way we do it is pretty specific. So first of all, every article that we publish with the reviews, which there are often video components for, will have a test methodology section. That section will define which drivers are used. If drivers are huge in performance, so we take this into account. I don't know what sites or channels don't. Uh, I can't, it's, it's honestly not something I've looked into, so it's, I just, I don't know what other people do. But the way we do it is, if I'm testing, say, let's take the 1080s. We just did all those liquid cooled 1080s. I knew I was going to be testing at least three 1080s over the span of about a month, and I knew that there would be a driver update in that month. So the decision we made was, let's, and I don't know the exact drive number off the top of my head, uh, but it is in the article. It's one of the 727 or 57, one of those drivers. But the decision we made was basically, let's take that newest driver at the time for the first 1080. I rebenched the Founders Edition card, so it was retested. We weren't taking results from May because that's, not a good thing. Uh, there's a couple of factors to it. Uh, let, let's go through that first. So first of all, taking old results often is okay for an old game like Metro Last Light, Shadow of Mordor, things like that. The reason you see sites like ours and others often using these games that are a few years old, in addition to, in our case, new games like GTA V, Mirror's Edge, and Doom, is because they provide some level of stability. So you can have these older games often don't need to retest them. I will retest them at least once uh, for every test pass just to make sure nothing's changed. But the two factors that can change are drivers and the game. So newer games like Doom, 
Doom is driving me crazy because it pushes a lot of performance changing patches. Every time one of those comes out, we retest all of the cards that are on the bench. And that's why every now and then you'll see a purge where we go from maybe 16 cards down to something like four or five. I try to do a minimum of five. So if you see that, that is because there's been a performance change either in the driver and it was a necessary driver or in the game software and we couldn't refuse the patch. With games like Assassin's Creed Syndicate, which I've revived for VRAM testing, the uh, test data for Assassin's Creed Syndicate doesn't really change based on the game because even though they haven't updated it recently, we're not testing on the newest patch, we're testing on an old one, and that's because I'm refusing the patch so that we can continue to use old data for cards that we no longer have access to because that's important in that use case. So it really depends specifically on what's being tested. As for uh, the 1080s I was talking about, so we, I knew I was going to be testing three 1080s. I retested the Founders Edition. That's four. Still a lot of work. Uh, but we did not have to retest a lot of other stuff. And basically, I picked the newest driver at the time at the start of the first card we were reviewing, which was the Seahawk. And then EVJ's Hybrid came out. A new driver was out around the same time. We refused that driver because it did not contain major game-changing performance uh, optimizations that were going to be relevant to our tests, but I still didn't want to download a new driver because now you're, you're not 100% sure what's in that driver package uh, outside of what they list, even though the, what was listed wasn't relevant to the test. So we take the older driver from the Seahawk test. Gigabyte Extreme comes along. There's a driver update still hanging there from the hybrid, but not a new new driver, just the one that came out with the hybrid. Refuse that update. We retest the uh, or test for the first time the gigabyte card with the driver that was used for the Seahawk. Hopefully you're following. So basically carry the same driver through a series of tests, find a stopping point, which is the gigabyte extreme card that we just reviewed, because I know I'm not looking at 1080s for a little while, and we call it there. And the next time we look at a 1080, uh, depending on what's going on, how the driver landscape has changed, if there are specific game optimizing changes, at that point we'll decide if we update, retest the cards, if we still have them, or if we uh, just use the existing drivers if nothing really has changed. So that's how we do it. Another factor of this, in order to keep some cards like the uh, GTX 1060 in the case of the 1080 review we just did, in order to keep some of those cards on the bench but still produce content in a timely manner, sometimes we'll use, uh, for example, in this case, the press driver for the 1060 before it was released was used, I think, for the 1060 cards. You can find this in the methodology. And then the other driver packages used for the 1080s. It's all defined in the article. The 1060 wasn't the focus. Uh, and the patch did not contain, the driver update did not contain optimizations that were relevant to our testing, so we're able to get away with that. But all of that is very clearly defined. And anytime we're testing, this is the important part, anytime we're testing one card specifically against another, all the 1080s, all the 1070s, all the RX 480s, or if we're looking at RX 480 versus 1060, we'll download the newest patch, drivers, whatever for games, for the drivers themselves, update, and then test based on that. So I think that kind of explains the way we do it. I can't speak for the other sites. I can tell you that, yes, uh, this is something I have taken into account since day one because I know there are big performance changes potentially from drivers. And so that's, that's all taken into account. Uh, it is not always possible to use the latest drivers and still see all the cards on the bench. In those cases, if there are not major critical game optimizing changes, then we'll use the older drivers. So that's, that's how all that works. Next question is from Sergio Eduardo Flores Mena, who says, uh, wouldn't integrated RAM drastically boost performance on integrated GPUs? So this is in reference to the last Ask Gen where we talk about HBM on CPUs in the future or on coprocessors or on whatever. Uh, the answer to that is yes, because the one of the biggest limiters of IGPs is the system memory speed. So that's why you'll see actually a legitimate performance gain from something like a 2400 or a 2133 megahertz kit of RAM versus maybe 1600 if we're not going too extremely low. Uh, so the answer to that is yes. It, there's still a, HPM is really freaking fast, so there's still kind of a cap to where you start running into issues with the limit of CUs or whatever, depending on what IGP you're using. Uh, die size is a limitation, certainly. So it's 
there is a limit to basically diminishing returns on something like that, theoretically. It's not something that exists yet, so it's all theory. But yeah, it would definitely increase performance on IDPs because they're most heavily limited by RAM. And then after that, they're, they're uh, compute units or equivalent. Next question, Matt McGregor. <clears throat> this is actually the last question for today. Matt McGregor says, love the in-depth Q&A videos. Can you, question, can you damage an AIO water cooler, three pin pump or four pin for that matter, running non-PWM with voltage control through basically external software, a speed fan in the case of this question. Uh, and then the next question was, if no damage is caused from voltage reduction, would it help prolong life of the pump running at slower speeds most of the time by reducing the voltage? So I, I talked to some people about this who engineer or at least work at the companies that engineer the pumps to get a clearer answer. The answer is, for the most part, the ideal pump voltage is 12 volts. And I guess you could lower it through uh, hardware or software solution. But from what we've been told, lowering the voltage to make the pump run at a lower speed won't necessarily prolong the pump life because the pump is spec'd to outlive basically everything else in the system. What will fail first or what will cause failure first is permeation of liquid through the tubes and through the system. We talked about this before. A lot of these coolers are spec'd to live about five years before they start losing too much liquid to remain at peak efficiency uh, or they start failing. And the pump has a fluid ceramic bearing in it, and that bearing is basically lubricated by the liquid going through the pump. So once you start having permeation, there's issues there. But the pump itself won't fail uh, just from running at 12 volts for its lifespan, uh, is the answer to that question, I think, in, in the most succinct way possible. So that is all for this Ask GN. For more questions, post them in the comments below. I'll get to them next week or something hopefully we won't be chased away by a golf cart enthusiast looking out for the business park's interests in its water fountain that we thought looked like a good backdrop <laughs> as always patreon like the post video helps out directly subscribe for more content i'll see you all next time